So I guess just to get started, even before starting, I want to acknowledge that this is a little bit ambitious as far as the scale of what I'm trying to cover. So two things. Definitely feel free to ask questions and delve in deeper on topics that you want me to go deeper on at the end of the session. Uh, use the mic, and we can get the whole thing recorded. That would be great. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do that's kind of come out of talking with this presentation about other people is between now and when I represent some sort of an updated version of this at the PM Summit in October, also here in Austin, actually, is basically put together a blog post on, or series of blog posts on the 10 or so slides that in and of themselves could be hour-long presentations. So with that, uh, I wanted to call this, oh, look, we're growing, because at least the way it's happened to us is it's been a twofold. Part of it, it was a conscious decision, and the other part of it is you know you're doing something right when your organization feels the pressure to grow without you doing anything to it. So who am I? I'm Adam Edgerton. I'm the Director of Operations at Metal Toad. We're out of Portland, Oregon. And I have basically a project management background. I now hold the Director of Operations title, and so that basically means I kind of have one foot in the internal workings of the organization. And on the other side of things, I manage the project management team. So the biggest piece there is, as of six months ago, I no longer day-to-day -day manage projects for our clients. So I'm curious, uh, and thank you, by the way, for everybody sticking around for the last session before the closing session. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I especially appreciate you coming to this one. So I'm curious, who in the organization is a freelancer or a sole proprietor? If you could raise your hands. Okay, a few. How about the two to 10 person organization size? All right, quite a few. How about, let's say, 10 to 50? Also quite a few. Uh, 50 to 100? Okay, a few. 100 plus? Okay, and what about, say, 1,000 plus, if there's any mega corporations? Awesome. So pretty widely represented. And how about uh, agency or service organization side versus client side? So agency side and client side. So mostly agency. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I did want to touch on what is Metal Toad just a little bit, because I realized the first time I gave this presentation at a local meetup group in Portland, people came back and said, yeah, that was great, but, you know, I didn't really realize how developer-focused you guys were. So while we do, you know, essentially everything in the digital spectrum to some extent or partner with other partners on it, most of our staff is development. We produce sites. Uh, so we have designer on staff, but often when, call, when heavy creative is called for, we partner. So if you see me saying developers a lot, uh, just go ahead and insert creative or UX architect or whatever else you might be thinking that is really relevant to your organization. So some important background is where have we been? And I really want to touch on this because it's really only one iteration of growth that I've experienced in three years at Metal Toad. I joined in 2011, and we were about 10 people. And as of just recently, we're 35 and on a trajectory to be 40-plus by the end of the year. So there's much bigger organizations out there. And obviously, on the smaller side of things, you also have different problems to deal with. And so we're kind of at the point now where I've already thought about what 50, 70, 100 people could look like. But I also want to really focus on relying on the experience of what growing from 10 to 35 has meant. And so that's meant a kind of forming of a real project management team. Uh, we've gone from two project managers to now five plus myself. Our project team size, so our core project teams, have gone from often sometimes as little as a single dedicated team member, uh, maybe two to three, up to now three to eight seems to be the common range. Average budgets have gone from anywhere from thirty to eighty thousand dollars to two hundred to five hundred thousand or more in some cases, and surprisingly enough, average timelines for a project engagement haven't stretched that much, at least compared to some of the other numbers. Instead, that's why you see the team size growing a little bit. So where are we going? Uh, basically, I wanted to touch on this because, as you'll see in the next slide. There's some good reasons to grow, and there's some bad reasons to grow. And a good reason to grow is because you have a reason to do it and a reason to get somewhere specific. So we started as a web shop. We do a lot of Drupal still. Uh, we did a lot more Drupal in the past even compared to our current mix. But really where we want to go, I think basically our founder, I've, I've heard him put it as he wants to steal 1% of Oracle's market share using open source. So to do that obviously requires a bigger organization. Um, to have some of the varied skill sets we're going to need requires a bigger organization. And to work on the type of projects we want to work on requires a bigger organization. 
So a few asterisks, because I'm sure everybody in the room, you know, who, who wants to grow? Who raise your hand? All right. So it's a double-edged sword. <clears throat> There's a lot of reasons you may not want to grow. Uh, when you're a service organization, I think it was Seth Brown at a DrupalCon presentation last year, said, as you get bigger, you don't necessarily make more money. And that's very true. As far as your profit goes, the extra collaboration, the extra meeting time required on a per-project basis, but kind of on the organization as a whole, you know, you might not make more in profit at $10 million than you do at $4 million. So that's something to think about. And that's where I think everybody sees this silver bullet into, well, I'll just pivot into product because that scales better than linear. And that's actually a lot harder, as you've probably heard at several of the sessions this week. It's a lot harder said than done. No, sorry, it's harder, a lot harder done than said. <laughs> uh, and so kind of like I touched on, growth for the sake of growth is actually really dangerous. You need to have a purpose first because otherwise, if you don't have some sort of very clear focused line on where you're going, you're going to grow in a very non-direct path, and you're going to have layoffs along the way. You're going to have bad quarters. You're going to have good quarters. So stay very focused. And the other thing that's a lot of, it's hard for a lot of us to grasp, it's hard for me to grasp some days, is pure tribal organization at some point starts to break down. And I want to say that's around 25 people, where it really, a little bit more structure is called for. And the trade-off with structure is red tape and bureaucracy. So I would advise you all, grow to the point where you're comfortable with the, with the level of red tape. And if you see it, the next step and the next evolution in your company being just a little bit too much, you might be okay where you're at, and you might want to consider turning it into a little bit more of a lifestyle. So why a project management approach? I kind of wanted to talk about this because I think project management is uniquely situated in the organization. They see the big picture. They have both the business in mind as far as project risk, project budgets, project timelines. They also see the customer needs. And in most organizations, Metal Toad included, project managers, project managers are directly customer facing. So given that, it's a really healthy place to be to see what the needs of your customers are as you grow, what the needs of your business is as it grows. Um, project managers are often the planners, the risk-averse type, and entrepreneurs who start businesses are often anything but. So it's a very healthy check to that sort of role. Project managers aren't necessarily great entrepreneurs because they're risk-averse, so you kind of need that person pushing you forward a little bit uncomfortably. But the project manager kind of provides the need of balance. And kind of like I touched on, growth creates risk. Um, growth really is risk. It's just pursuing the unknown and trying to figure out where you might end up and predict where you might end up. And before getting to the agenda, the other thing I want to touch on is two types of growth. Uh, there's scaling organizations, and then there's scaling projects. And you really have to balance the two of these as well. Um, you can grow an organization, and you can grow projects independent of each other. But the dangerous situations to end up in are $10,000 projects when you have 100 people in your organization. And so just the chaos and the inefficiency of even trying to collaborate at that scale is a mess. The other way is if you're a five-person organization and you're working on million-dollar projects, that's a huge amount of risk to take on from a business perspective, where if you lose that client and you don't have something else waiting in the wings, you could be out of business in a hurry. So really, these two kind of go hand-in-hand hand to me. So because I'm a project manager, I had to have an agenda. I want to let you guys know what we're going to look at. But I did want to touch on the order. We're going to talk teams, then people, then process, and then tools, and that's because, partly because... I'm a big believer in the Agile Manifesto, probably more so even than most Agile practice as a whole. And one of the core tenets there is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And if you've ever read a blog post or heard me speak, that's something that I've definitely talked about before, where you really have to get the team dynamics right. Otherwise, the process and the tools, while important, don't ultimately matter. Following that, we're going to kind of talk through a little bit more of the project management approach and some specifics. And then I wanted to wrap up with kind of talking about coping with growth, because growth is hard and kind of painful. So within teams, I wanted to start, start kind of at the smaller core level of talking about project growth when it comes to teams. And if any of you have read the book, The Mythical Man Month, uh, one of the things it talks about is something called Brooks Law. And Brooks Law says that adding more developers to a late software project makes it later. I think probably some of you have experience that talks directly to this. Um, healthcare.gov, the core Cover Oregon website, where you talk about $100 million website projects and 100-plus person implementation teams. It falls down, and as things get late, they've tried to add more, and it doesn't help the situation. 
So think about this even at a smaller scale. Even if your projects are five people, six people, by the time you spread your project duration out and you have nine-month projects as your average, say, you know, the, the ramp up and the time required to get somebody on board to actually contribute to a project at seven months, I would say is probably 10 times harder than it is in two months in. And very similarly, I think it was Amazon that kind of coined the notion of two pizza teams. Uh, but basically, Amazon, even at a massive scale, has always tried to stay a divisional organization. And so that's kind of what we've looked at at Metal Toad. And we're getting, we're kind of in this mid transition phase where as we get bigger, this is going to become more and more of a need. Uh, right now, this is just naturally our project team size that we want to gravitate towards. But when we have 50 developers on staff, it's something that we're really going to have to reinforce for ourselves. And part of the reason I think that's been a big thing for us is that beyond that point, I've actually done some research and wrote a couple of blog posts a couple of years ago. Beyond a certain point, while you achieve scale with a project manager's time from a budget perspective on a project, as you scale up your project team, the amount of meetings and collaboration required just to get anything done also goes up significantly. So the theory is, you know, at a 100-developer team, you might spend 90% of your time just meeting, trying to figure out what everybody is doing. So that's where the five to eight for us has worked really well. And that's where the, the two pizza essentially is a, a team size that you could feed with two pizzas. So it depends how hungry you are to some extent. <laughs> uh, I wanted to touch on collaboration and first acknowledge that, yes, it is a buzzword. It's almost as bad as innovation. But that said, it's an important one. And I, so I wanted to think a little bit about pair programming, swarming, and meetings in general, where they all have really positive impacts when they're used right. But as teams get bigger, as projects get more complex, always focus on what is it you're creating. Because I've seen a lot of teams devolve into essentially trying to stay organized and trying to plan what they're doing more than actually focusing on, well, we still need to ship something at the end of this project. So it has to be that careful balance. And with that, now I wanted to kind of take that and scale that up to the organization level and talk teams at the organization level. So kind of where I see Metal Toad going is teams as mini organizations. And this is a concept that actually fits well with kind of the two pizza team idea. Uh, the thought is we're not there yet because we don't have enough duplication of people or I guess redundancy in roles where we can essentially create teams that are complete units. Uh, but at 50, maybe 60 people, I think we're going to reach the point where we'd rather fight the battle of making sure knowledge is spread amongst diverse teams that aren't on the same projects than fight the battle of trying to resource and plan all of our projects from a developer pool of 30, 40 developers. At least to me, that sounds like a nightmare. So essentially what this means is at some point you have 10, maybe 12, maybe 15 person mini teams within your organization. At, that, at the top of that, there needs to be some sort of technical lead. There also needs to be some sort of a business lead. And that could very well be a project manager's evolution in the organization, is into that role that sees the account side of the business, it sees the business needs and the business requirements, and it's also the experienced project manager who can mentor other project managers on the team. And it's ultimately what that turns your agency into is kind of a holding company. And so you diversify your risk across, instead of you know five to six projects, at some point, it's across four, five, six, seven, eight teams. Departments. Departments happen, unfortunately, um, or fortunately in some cases. So as we've grown, we now have a true project management department rather than a couple of individuals. We have a development department, obviously, but that's now broken down into managed services, kind of our core production team. And then we also have a strategy team, which kind of serves as a stand-in for our sales team, uh, but it's much more focused on getting up in front of a whiteboard and planning a technology solution than it is pushing a sale. Um, the main risk to call out here and the concern to be aware of is the matrix model. And so I don't know if you're familiar with this, but essentially this is what the matrix model looks like. And in the worst cases where I've seen it employed, it means that essentially each person on a team has two managers. They have whoever their essentially vertical manager would be in their department, so a director of de development, say. And then they have their team manager, and so that could be the project manager or the business lead. And the dangerous thing here is you don't you have people who don't have the autonomy they're looking for all of a sudden. You have mixed messages coming from multiple managers. So I'm really a big advocate for project managers to actually not have a people management role on their teams. 
I'm much more a fan of project managers being a part of the team at the same level as your developers and your creatives and really focusing on the business and the client outcomes. And that's been a really healthy thing. Yeah. Just a quick question. When you say project managers, are you using it interchangeably with the team lead? Not necessarily. This is kind of the graph. So the question is, am I using team lead and project manager interchangeably? That's one person who I think could fill that role, depending on your organization. But I, that is a good comment to make because I'm also talking producers, project managers, product owners. Your organization may call them something slightly different, and they'll have slightly different tasks. But they do fall within a similar category to me. So Metal Toad, we've used project manager, and we've actually talked about changing the do job title but haven't figured out what we change it to. So. So now that's kind of the overall team perspective. Let's talk about the people on those teams a little bit, starting at the project level. So I think when we were 10 people, we didn't actually give enough credit to the fact that every developer's skill set, every creative skill set is a little bit different. I think when it came to resourcing and how we put people on teams, it was a little bit too much. You know, a developer's a developer, and so let's stick one here and let's stick one there. And oh, this one needs three people, so let's put three people there. So even at a, at a young company size, you can really start to think about and even label to some extent, who are the junior developers who really need to be mentored? Who are your core developers that just get things done? Who are the seniors who are going to grow into architects and really are the people who want to mentor? And we've actually, as we've grown, established this as a program at Metal Toad, where we essentially bring in juniors in a two-year program. They're, the production and the results from their development are actually, the, the emphasis on that is lessened, the emphasis on wanting to contribute, wanting to learn is much greater. And instead, our seniors who are doing the mentoring are actually responsible for the outcome of what those junior developers code. Uh, but definitely think about the diverse range of experience you're going to get on teams. And you have to end up balancing that across your projects as you get bigger. Because if you try to throw all the juniors at one project or even all the new employees at one project, you're setting that thing up for failure. Uh, this one I actually grabbed from the University of Oregon Business School when I was there. And it's really, a, I think it's an interesting way of looking at team dynamics. And it kind of groups people into four categories. So you've got your thinkers, and often these are the architect types, the maybe the big picture planners for projects. They're also often not the best at actually getting things done because they love to just sit down and plan all the time. There's the doers, and these are often project manager types. Uh, they can be developer types too. These are probably, as a project manager, some of your favorite developers and some of your favorite creatives if you have some on staff. There's the challengers, the devil's advocates, so to say. Um, also a very important role to have on a project because if you don't have this represented, you risk groupthink and you risk doing the same thing over and over again without really thinking about why you're doing it. And then there's supporters, and this is kind of the cheerleader role. This is the person who, when everybody's burning towards the end of the project, is going to say, hey guys, we can do this, let's get it done, and be there for the team. And I think what's really important for the project manager role to think about in this context is that your team is going to have some of all four of these, and people can shift roles even throughout the duration of a project. But as a project manager, you really need to think about are there gaps at any specific time? Is somebody not playing one of these roles? And if so, you need to embody that role. If there's no challenger, you need to challenge. If there's no supporter, you need to support. And I think that's really kind of a core thing to basically making sure your team is collaborating well. There's also role specialization that happens over time. So we've kind of identified some people are more focused on DevOps, some people are more focused on front end, some people are more back end. And as you get bigger and as your projects get more complex specifically, you have to both identify who are the right people with the right skill set and the right background for a project. And often, like at the 35 size right now, far too often we only have one person on staff who's, this is the person for this specific task on this specific project. And so that's why I'd actually say 35 right now is a really awkward size for us, because we want a little bit more redundancy than that. But you also have to kind of look at who's willing and excited on the project, because I've seen people who don't have the knowledge yet but are excited and willing to learn do a better job just because they spend the time and they spend the extra hours when necessary to go learn it. And when it comes to people kind of at the organization level, talking about them at the employee level, this also applies to project managers. When you're small, I really enjoyed wearing a lot of hats and being a strategist one day and a QA person the next and a project manager all the time and an account manager some of the time. As you grow, you really have to focus. And you're going to have to help your team along in this focus as well because they're going to have to pick their spot in the organization as roles get more closely defined. But as you do that, 
it really gives you the depth of the field that you get to focus in. So I've seen people who are resistant to this. And you can often find the generalist roles at any size. Because I'm such a generalist, I've kind of forced myself up to the level in the organization where I still get to be a generalist and wear a lot of hats. But it also gives you the opportunity to go really deep on a specific area. So a lot of our developers, some of them go more into people management. Some of them go into, you know what, I really want to master the back end. And that's my role. You get some awkward resourcing going on, and this happens in different phases. Um, at 35, we're in this weird intermediate zone where we don't quite always get dedicated developers on projects, even though that's what we strive for. But at 10 people, that just wasn't even a reality. Like, we either put one person full time on a project and hope they could handle everything, or it was like, you know, a third of a project, or sorry, a third of a project manager's day, a third of a front end's day, a third of a back end's day to get the project done. So, given that, you have to just kind of be aware of when this is happening and try to grow past it or find ways around it. So for instance, at 35 right now, we're very close to almost fully dedicated developers on every project. I hope by the time we're 50, we get there. But at this size, we're still not too dedicated project managers, which is also a really nice thing to have. And so even at a half million dollar project, usually our, usually our project managers are still managing two to three projects at a time. I'd say it's probably the million dollar mark where we can actually dedicate them. So. There's a good reason for growth there and that you get better quality on your projects simply by having dedicated teams throughout. So talking about process now. Uh, on the project level, obviously, this one's kind of a no-brainer, but your life cycle is going to get more complex. It's going to have more defined phases throughout it. And this one's one where process is inevitable. You really need it to survive. But again, this is one where you have to balance and always think about, am I creating red tape or actually am I doing something helpful and something reusable and something that's not going to get in the way? Because really when I call out what the project manager's role should be, it should be two things. It should be identifying risks and mitigating them, and it should be helping your team work better. And yeah, you might be doing 50 different things in a day, but in theory, you should be able to lump every one of them into one of those two categories. So this is a big, this is probably my biggest reach in the entire presentation, but I'm going to try to solve the Agile versus Waterfall debate once and for all in two slides. We'll see if I can do it. <laughs> so at a very basic level, it's all about uncertainty. It's well-defined projects, short timelines, variables aren't going to change, business needs aren't going to change. Sure, do Waterfall. As soon as you have enough uncertainty, there's a high likelihood that, you know what, six months down the road, this isn't actually what they're going to need. Or, you know what, they don't want, know what they want well enough to actually get started. Or, we think we know what they want, but they don't know what they want. There's so many variables where if there's any uncertainty beyond being able to essentially write a technical specification, then Agile might be called for. So I wanted to kind of introduce the cone of uncertainty, which you may have seen something very similar to this. Uh, the horizontal axis is essentially time. Um, I don't know if this goes back as far as the beginning of time, but essentially it's the beginning of the project, wherever that might be. That could be a year before you've even heard of it. That could be your client's team is talking about something as just an idea, and by the time it gets to you, whether that's an RFP format or you get in the door before the RFP, it has a lot more definition to it. Um, so, and, the, and then the, the uh, vertical axis is essentially the uncertainty measure. So not surprisingly, early on in a project, there's more uncertainty. On ship day, hopefully there's no uncertainty, but that's never quite the case. <laughs> so basically, this question you have to answer for your own organization is, where does your divider line happen in this? And so you can kind of see my dotted line there. That's my representation of, for Metal Toad, and I didn't put any measures on here, but that's kind of our point where, you know what, things are well-defined enough. And given this client's uh, approach and their knowledge of what we're doing, waterfall is actually low risk here, and it's going to allow us to get the job done better. Anywhere left of that line, water, or Agile is probably called for, with the big asterisk there of if you're going to spend more time teaching your client Agile than it's going to take to complete the project, waterfall is probably called for. Otherwise, you can always land somewhere in the middle. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody doing pure waterfall or pure Agile in, in an agency recently. So it's, again, a spectrum of more Agile versus less Agile. Uh, and when it comes to customization or standardization, this is another reason, actually, why Agile is hard, is because when you're a service organization, you really have to follow your client's process. You're always going to find less resistance if you mold yourself a little bit to your client. I mean, stick with your core process, sure, but find the ways to make it that much less, like, 
knock down the two or three main barriers for the client simply by using their tool versus yours or by communicating status updates the way they're used to doing them internally. So you're always going to have to have some sort of a custom process is my take on it. And when it comes to process at the organization level, in a very similar manner, hopefully you have some sort of framework for your process. So I don't, I intentionally don't like our team documenting things down to the detail level where every step of the way is documented and there's essentially a guide that you hand to a new project manager on day one and say, go, just do all this stuff and you'll be fine. That's a little bit too much. I try to hire project managers who are smarter than that, who want to do things custom, who want to serve the client better. That said, having some sort of a framework around what you do as an organization and the key things that you have to do to be successful is really important. So Metal Toad has this concept of stage gates. And stage gates is essentially, I think we have a couple different versions, but in one of them it's about 19 checkpoints throughout the course of a project where it's things like, do we have some sort of specifications in place on a more waterfall project? Or on an agile project, is the backlog healthy and sized by this point in the project? And that's one where we found if we don't do those sorts of things, we end up failing more often than not on projects, or at least it certainly increases the risk on projects significantly. When it comes to documentation, I really like to take an approach of why not what, because again, I've seen a lot of documentation that's step-based. It's basically, here's the process for doing this, you cover these things and you're done. And the problem is, documentation has a very limited shelf life in some cases, and the more you grow and the faster you grow, the shorter that shelf life becomes. I would say for Metal Toad right now, it's about a year. We wrote a project management handbook a year and a half ago, and I'd say at this point, probably 40% of the information in there that we've managed to keep up to date is still relevant. So instead, think about the why. Explain in your, in your documentation the purpose behind what you're trying to do, and explain what the outcome should be, and that can be, you know, in what type of way is the client satisfied? Or, you know, we want to maintain, like, for, one of, for example, one of our philosophies is we want projects within 10% over budget, but we're willing to go 10% over budget if it means keeping the client happy or going above and beyond to give them that extra something to make sure they come back. And so simply putting down that kind of philosophy in paper, we don't need to say, you know, the process is check your budget and check in with the other project managers every other day to see if there's any new risks about it going 10% over budget. It's much more the, there's this kind of line in the sand we want to draw and here's why, and that's probably a rule that we're going to keep around for years. Just like documentation has a useful shelf life, process decays. And so the thing I really wanted to guide project managers on here, because it's one that I've had to fight myself on at times, is stepping back and having the awareness of when you're holding on to something just simply because it's something you created. So I kind of, I would say, I'd say essentially gutted and rebuilt much of our process at Metal Toad two and a half years ago now. And the amount of that we're still using is almost zero. And I like it that way. But I also realized probably a year, year and a half ago that I almost needed our entire project management team to push me because I can't push them as well as they can push me to show me what's broken with my own processes. So really, this is a really useful thing that comes out of having teams, is sitting down as a group and saying, you know what, what are we doing well, what aren't we? And this thing that we've done for two years, why do we do that? Again, this is where it's useful to have that challenger role come in. And talking about tools, I didn't break this one into projects or into the organization level, simply because hopefully you're using the same for both to some extent. Um, and those of you who've heard me talk about tools before, I'm kind of a little bit, I don't know, I probably harp on this too much, but I really talk about process first and tool second. And the reason for this, actually, it happened at Bad Camp a couple years ago. I sat down in a project management-related bird of the feather, and it kind of scared me that the question prompted was essentially like, okay, tell us about your process. And immediately, the discussion was about tools. And it was really confusing to me. It's like, wait, this isn't really process. This is tools, and we're trying to build process around them. So the problem you run into there is, as you all well know, there is no perfect tool. There's not going to be. And so if you try to build your process around a tool, you're going to end up with something that's kind of trying to fit the mold. If you really figure out, you know what, this is, going to, this is what's going to work for this client, and here's the things that work for our organization from a process level, and then you say, okay, here's these five tools. Which one's going to fit that process the best? That's been a much healthier way for us to approach things, so I'd encourage you to do the same. Uh, this one doesn't necessarily surprise me, and I love to work in spreadsheets, so I'm probably going to advocate for using them as often as possible, even as we grow, but... 
probably at 10 people, you use a lot of spreadsheets for things that may ultimately become tools. That said, spreadsheets still always have their place. And so the thing I've seen a lot is you get kind of stuck in your tool and the way you use that tool, and it's not resonating with your clients, and it's not resonating with the executives, and it's not resonating with the rest of your team. And usually the simplest way to solve that is to take whatever data it is you're trying to communicate and either pull it back into a spreadsheet or create a chart around it or create a status update around it you know, with bullet lists. And communicating differently with different people obviously works better. But often I've seen tools actually inhibit the ability to communicate information. So make sure that's not happening. Tool proliferation happens. Um, this is kind of a question that you have to weigh as well. Are you going to adopt the mega tool, whether that be MS Project or something like it? Or are you going to have a different tool for every task? And at Metal Toad, we've kind of picked the latter. Um, it's a little tricky in sometimes communicating to the organization what tools you're using and why. And so one of my current projects is actually kind of creating a visual map of the project life cycle versus when we use tools and why. Um, and so again, it's a why type of documentation I'm working on there. But the reason we've kind of gone with proliferation again is because of that process first mentality where the tools and the tools we're picking need to support the process. And so the problem is something like an MS project is really going to force us to rework the way we want to do things that we think works best to fit how this tool says we should do things. And all that comes with a caveat of Whatever you do, if you're picking tools that aren't going to get adoption simply because they're not easy to use and people don't want to use them, they're going to fail regardless. Um, I don't have a good example of complete failure, but Metal Toad, we switched from Lighthouse to Jira about a year and a half ago for ticket tracking. And it's one where it's a lot more clicking in Jira. And yes, you can customize and there's amazing workflow tools, but the amount of time required versus the project scale we're working at is still not there. I see even more use for JIRA at million plus dollar projects or true enterprise projects. But where we're at, it's almost overkill. And so while we use it because we love some of the QA tools, it's a pain in the ass and people don't like using it. So that kind of covers the four categories. And now I wanted to really focus a little bit more on the project management approach and why I think project management is in the right place to steer the organization. So if you're familiar with Scott Birkin, he has a great blog post, and I encourage you all to go Google it and read it. It's called Everything is a Project. And so the notion there is everything, if you define it as such, there's always some sort of an implied budget, an implied timeline, an implied scope. So it could be the simplest project as getting up and pouring yourself a cup of coffee in the morning. You can still identify that as, well, here's the timeline, and then here's the next thing in the sequence. Here's the steps involved. So... Obviously, obviously, it's easy to overplan, but when it comes to growing your organization, a lot of planning is required, and having somebody doing that planning and worrying about the future is actually pretty much a requirement. Project management, kind of like I mentioned, seeing the client and the business side of things, they also see the full landscape, even on a project level. You see the big picture. You should understand what the goals of the project are and why, but you also probably know the 10 to-dos for that specific day in the project. So on the organizational level, same thing comes up. You probably know the 10 tasks on your own to-do list and the 10 tasks on the rest of the team's list. But you also really want to have, and you probably do have, a good vision of what is the goal and why are we growing. And being able to see that as a single system really helps guide the organization. From there, it's kind of the role that I've stepped into where I have one foot on the client side and one foot on the internal business side you really kind of have to project manage the org. At some point, the operations of the company don't just happen anymore. Whether this becomes, you know, at 10 people, all of a sudden, somebody needs to stock the fridge. And so I can say that up until we were 22, 23 people, I was still washing the dishes before we had a dishwasher. Obviously, stepping up to that sort of thing is really helpful, but at some point, it also makes sense to structure and hire around having an organization. So now we actually have an office concierge who's kind of a, a client-facing office manager. And in my role, my goal is essentially to be the project manager to our leadership team and to define things in our, our major goals as projects and to execute on them. Uh, I want to touch on due diligence, which is very jargony, and the way I'm defining it isn't so much in the doing diligence as you're looking to a buy or sell a company. It's much more the definition I would give it is the process of systematically researching and verifying the accuracy of a statement. So you're going to get a lot of this speculation going on while you're growing. Of You know, I think this will happen when we grow, but... 
I hate to break it to you. You could have the most novel business concept in the world, but there are thousands, millions probably, of organizations who have already gone through the same growth process that you have. So go talk to people and learn. I mean, even in Portland, I have half a dozen mentors who are at bigger organizations than I am, and they've seen the pain along the way and understood what the unexpected complexities were. So there's always somebody to reach out to. There's the Internet, and there's a lot of good information there, obviously. But really think about and plan for the future. Uh, project managers, I also think, are best suited to really understand what's going to be best from a project perspective. And so that's kind of the decision. Do you go for being a license plate shop and turn out the same thing over and over again and get a really efficient process? Or do you diversify and do completely different projects and try to figure out, you know, should we use these different technologies on this project? Should we be moving more into JavaScript? Should we be focusing solely on Drupal projects? There's a lot of different ways to focus here, but project management, I think, has a good history, especially if you've been at your organization for a while, of what type of project does well for us, what type of pro project fits our developer and creative goals from a career perspective. Do they want to turn out license plates or do they want to do custom? And depending on the day and what they've been working on, the answer could be yes to both. If they've been working on something where they're banging their heads against a project and they're trying to learn every day, they might look for, you know, I really just want a brochure bur bur site tomorrow. If they've been doing five brochure sites in a row, it might be time for something interesting. So you really do have to find that balance again. Uh, steering well, things that apply in projects should also apply to your organization. So use retrospectives. Uh, sit down every three months with your team and kind of say, okay, we set up this goal and how have we got, like how far have we gotten towards accomplishing it? What are the things we've learned along the way that are going well? What isn't going well? And what takeaways are we gonna implement? Status updates, same thing. Um, there becomes a lot more of a need for reporting. The people, you know, your founders, uh, kind of the principals, the leaders of the organization aren't going to have the same visibility and shouldn't have the same visibility into the day-to-day -day of your projects that they did at 10 people. So it almost becomes a necessity at some point to start reporting out at least the high-level status of what's going on, kind of capturing those Im important bites that are going to allow them to steer well. And projections. Uh, again, you have a, hopefully a lot of past historical data. We end up tracking time, as I'm sure many of you do. And there's a lot of good information in that data. So you have your historical project bias. You have what's happening now. And given that, you can start to predict, especially if you have outside mentors, with where you're going to be in the next steps of your organization's growth. I'm a big advocate for the project management role to have some sort of say in the sales cycle. Obviously, this doesn't necessarily mean doing day-to-day -day sales, but in our organization, that's included kind of steering things from an account perspective. It's also included writing statements of work. But as much as anything, again, you have a healthy view uh, of what is a healthy project, what is likely to be profitable, what is the, the team going to want to work on. Um, but also really think about what are the other pieces that make a healthy project, whether that is is this client going to be good to work with or not? Or are they going to make our lives painful for the next six months? Um, you know, is it a brand that we want to put on our website if your goal is really to grow the size and the clout of your accounts? So there's a lot of different things to think about there. And then, as you've probably heard me say like 20 times in this presentation, the word balance, I think really that's what it comes down to is because growth is pure risk, essentially, you're trying to balance the known with the unknown. And it's a really careful balance but I think it's really, again, the project manager is the person who can find that and really communicate that to the rest of the organization. So finally, I wanted to touch a little bit on coping and starting with coping at the organizational level because there's a lot of interesting pains that come up as you grow. So sales is one thing. Hiring is another where take a project management approach to it. Um, so I've never been that involved in hiring beyond project managers where I do take a very close look at what's going on. But I also helped shape what our process of getting people in the door looks like. And right now, I'm also working on trying to make sure our onboarding is as improved as possible. Because there's a huge ramp up. First of all, you have to get the right people. And I'm sure that's not news to anybody. It's like sales and who you hire are going to make or break your organization. But we've also more recently really kind of started identifying just how huge the ramp up time for even an experienced developer or an experienced designer can be. 
that can be months in a lot of cases. And project managers are no different. And we kind of estimate that it's often six to nine months before a project manager is really up to speed and can run solo on projects that are big projects where there's a lot of risk involved. That's almost regardless of how many years of experience they have prior. Certainly they can handle a client call, but until they've had that year or so of past experience with the type of projects you deal in and how they tend to result, they don't necessarily have the ability to steer. When it comes to hiring especially, there's two different approaches here, and I've actually changed my tune on this one a little bit because I always found myself coming from a point of, well, you know what? There's a lot of pressure, and yes, we want to hire these six different people, but we can only hire two people because of cash flow. And so given that, I was always kind of an advocate for, I'm feeling the biggest pain from the organization, and I'm hearing the most pain from here, so we must need another developer. But I also realized that's kind of fighting from behind and fighting fires. And so if you can really strive to think about and look at other organizations and say, how have they structured themselves? What roles did they hire and at what size? You can kind of plan your hiring roadmap much more strategically. Uh, I've touched on rules and policies and philosophies just a little bit, but our VP of people actually has something that I really like that I kind of stole from him here, which is he's a huge advocate for philosophies over policies. And this is one area where you can actually hold on to some of that tribal leadership or the tribal organization, even as you potentially add extra structures in management or in the way your organization operates. This is one where we recently we rolled back any sort of a PTO policy in favor of unlimited PTO, partly because that's an area where the industry is just shifting that way, but partly because we thought it fit with our overall approach of philosophies, where really we hire people who we expect will do a good job, and then we trust them to do a good job and get out of the way. And as long as people are then living up to that standard, if they understand what the philosophies behind the rules you would want to normally set are, they're going to live those out regardless. And at that point, it simply becomes a performance issue if there's something you need to deal with. And finally, and Metal Toad isn't even by any means beyond this because we still have plenty of people who don't pass this rule, but we've used something that's kind of called the hit by a bus test, which in reality it's more is the pers if the person leaves the organization, what would happen? Because hopefully nobody gets hit by a bus. But basically this is... Is there a single dependency on your project or at the organizational level, is there a single dependency in the organization where if that person gets hit by a bus tomorrow, first of all, how well documented is their role and what they do and how well widespread is the knowledge of what they do so that somebody could pick it up and run like nothing happened? Because as you grow, every time somebody leaves, it's that much more of a setback versus just replacing somebody as you're turning along, doing the same type of projects and maintaining your organization size. Um, this one also, from, a, from your career perspective and from mine, it's something that I've had to think about a lot where really one of my goals and the way I structure it right now is in a year, I want to be able to walk away and have all of the things I'm doing today be done by somebody else. Because as you grow, there's always something new. So I've seen people kind of latch on to, no, this is my role and I need to make sure this is preserved. And you're actually really doing yourself and the organization as a whole a disservice when you look at it that way. So a few last pieces kind of touching on the individual level of coping with growth, because it is a hard thing for some people, everybody really. Uh, most people are change averse, myself included, some days more than others. And you do get people who, uh, Michael Lopp at the PM Summit last year gave a presentation on the idea of stables versus volatiles. And so you, you can probably identify the couple of people in your organization who love to disrupt the organization who cause a lot of good change, some bad change along the way, but essentially will cause chaos. That's a good thing to an extent, but by and large, most people in most project management types especially are change averse, and that's not surprising because you're also risk averse in a lot of cases. So there's a great book out there. It's a business book. It's called Who Moved My Cheese, and it's worth reading if you haven't. Um, but it basically gives you a framework for understanding why it's healthy to let go of what you're doing and accept and embrace change. Uh, there's also risk everywhere. Kind of like I've mentioned, growth is risk. You, the two are almost interchangeable when I talk about it. And so this is one where it has to become embracing the risk rather than you, you certainly want to identify it. You are the person who should say, hey, I see this big risk coming. This is a problem. We need to do something about it. But don't become a blocker when you do it. Um, be very solution-oriented. And when your leadership team says, you know what, I hear you, but we're going to do that anyway, because they will, 
you kind of have to embrace it and just go along for the ride because it'll probably make things more interesting. And especially if things break down the road, that's even better because you get to come swoop in and save it. Your career trajectory, kind of touching on the wearing all the hats again. Um, as a project manager, again, like I said, when we were 10 people, I could kind of do whatever I wanted to right up until the point where I was deploying code. But that would be you know, making changes on our website. It would be doing QA. It would be doing strategy, some business development, and certainly some project management involved. But as you grow, you really do have to define what you want to do and focus down. So I encourage you, especially at the smaller sizes, to dabble a little bit, to even if you really don't feel the need and your organization doesn't push you to do anything beyond day-to-day -day project management, to learn the other areas of your organization. It's going to certainly make you a better project manager, but you may also find that as you grow and as you really find yourself more in spreadsheets and planning and tracking and dealing with customer complaints and a little bit less with, say, strategy that you like to enjoy or you used to enjoy so much, that you actually want to shift that direction. And so identifying that early is a really healthy way to grow within the organization and say, you know what, I'm actually, I enjoy this PM thing, but I want to do something else, and here's the role I see for myself. You're going to have that opportunity along the way. And finally, I really, I had this notion today, and so I changed this slide. But think of yourself, I don't know if you've ever seen some of the crazy rally car driving that they'll do, like the off-roading where they'll actually, I mean, they'll have driven the course certainly many times before, and you don't get that benefit when you're growing for the first time. But you've got the driver, and the driver essentially has to react on gut and their navigator. And the navigator knows the course and is calling out the course because they're driving fast enough where you can't actually see around the next three corners and that you're going to be covering in the next two seconds. So when you think about it that way, you probably have somebody else besides yourself driving. That might be a single founder. It might be an advisory board. It might be several uh, principals of your organization, any number of people. And often it's that entrepreneurial spirit that started it. So really think of yourself as the navigator and make sure that you've steered your organization to the extent possible and you're able to step up to that level. That's really what I want to make sure. If you get one thing out of that, be a project manager. Don't let your project suffer. But there's certainly room to step above and really take on growing the organization from a project management level. So hopefully that was informative. You learned a few things. And I'd love to take some questions and thoughts. And please use the mic so it's all recorded. First of all, I just have to say that was incredibly helpful and refreshingly pragmatic. As a Thanks. owner of a small agency looking to grow, you've totally laid out a roadmap, so that was great. And you also did answer the waterfall versus agile for me, so thanks. Awesome. <laughs> um, so my question is, I'm very intrigued by the policies versus philosophies slide. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little more about what that looks like. Do, are the philosophies written down somewhere? How... How does that work? Sure. Well, I'll give you, I think part of it is just our culture at Metal Toad, where we've naturally found ourselves rejecting too much policy. Um, so just kind of actually uttering that as a phrase was like, oh, yeah, that is kind of who we are. Uh, one was we actually had a document that was written up that didn't necessarily get beyond the higher levels of management. There was basically a policy for who gets to book meeting rooms and when. And it came out of this whole notion of as we've grown, we've actually also run out of office space. And so meeting rooms were in high demand, especially call rooms. And so this basically set down a, if it's a in-person client meeting or an interview, you get to bump people from these other things. And it's like, wait, why do we have people bumping people from rooms? And why is that down in writing? This is really something that there's a philosophy behind it. And it's, yes, obviously our clients are important and interviewees are important. But it doesn't necessarily call for kicking somebody out of their meeting room. And so that's one simple example. But a lot of them, actually, there's other toads in the audience. So can you throw some other ones that have been instrumental for you? Well, taking that example, how would you rewrite that policy to become a sure. philosophy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but then, how's the is the philosophy formally communicated in any way? Like, oh, some are and some aren't. Clients so, are important. For instance, the PTO you know, policy. Like, we we did have it structured, and we have an employee handbook. And in that employee handbook, we had a structured PTO policy. And so the new one is documented as just because it's unlimited doesn't actually mean you get to take every day of the year off. Here's some general guidelines for how much you should take off and why you should take off. But we really focused on more of the why. So it's like we do actually want you taking time off because it's healthy because we've realized if you never take a vacation, you're going to burn out. And that's not what we want. Um, we focused on kind of some of the work-life balance aspects of it. 
But we also said, you know, take sick days because we realize that if you take a day off and rest up and heal up, first of all, you're not going to get other people sick. But second, you're going to be back in action quicker. So mm-hmm. it's, it's really kind of identifying those things, but usually it comes down to documenting it somewhere as simply as possible. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So at the, uh, at the, the business summit on Monday, there was a, a couple round tables for uh, Drupal agency shops talking about scaling organizations. So covered a lot of the same uh, subject matter. One of the things we talked about was like inflection points as you grow mm-hmm. and determining when those inflection points are. You mentioned you have like a VP of people, right? Right. I bet you didn't have it at 10. Nope. So when did you know <laughs> you needed that VP of, pers- of people person? Mm-hmm. Um, and when did you d- determine you couldn't live without that person? Sure. Yeah, I think you've probably all seen organizations that staffed up at the bottom too heavily and had no leadership. You've probably also seen organizations that staffed up, staffed up at the top too heavily and had, you know, a developer for or a director for every developer, essentially. And, again, finding somewhere the sweet spot in the middle is right. Um, this one for us, actually, it's more we've always kind of taken the approach of as long as we're able to from a financial standpoint. If we identify somebody who's going to be transformational for the company, we'll hire them regardless when possible. So definitely look for those opportunities. And our VP of people, actually, we didn't even hire as the VP of people. He started in client services. And we quickly identified, yeah, client services are important. And, you know, try to hold on to parts of that that are most important. But we, we really want you in this people role. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to approach that. But I'd say the inflection points for us, just more than 10 people is where I kind of had my oh, this is a real company moment. And actually, I was a little scared coming to, I came from an organization of about 80 to Metal Toad when it was 10. And it was one of those, it's like, okay, they, they've almost reached real company status. This almost feels like there's something going on, but it's still a little corner office. And so it was, it was risk that I saw for myself of taking on, this could go somewhere or it could stay 10 or we could be out of business in two months. So there's an inflection point that happens 10 to 15 where it's like, okay, we're stable enough. We have kind of all of our bases covered. There's somebody in every role. I think we really stabilized in the mid-20s for a while and figured out how to make that work for us. And so now we're essentially, again, trending up. And so we're in the middle of a big inflection point right now. The 30s are kind of miserable for a number of different reasons. So I'm excited to get to 40, 45, 50. And I'm I'm guessing that's kind of where our next period of stabilization happens. Um, But again, it's also hard. We're bootstrapped. And so we have the good news is we have more work to do right now than we have people to do it. And the contracts aren't an issue. It's really more because we're bootstrapped, how quickly can we possibly hire without taking on extra invest, investment or extra debt? Because that's something we've tried to stay away from. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. So first question was, what is my thought on how many projects a project manager should have? Uh, Definitely that kind of corresponds to project size. Um, So one thing we did actually, it was in our 20s, we kind of took all of our small projects and our managed services and kind of service agreement and hosting and support engagements, rolled those up with a single project manager who now has probably 15 projects, but they're all small. Um, the real reason we did that is we were at the point where most of our projects at the, say, the 100K size, we had three, maybe four projects per project manager, and that was pretty healthy, except they'd also, also often have three or four small projects that were just kind of lingering. And they had the worst habit of coming back, all of them, on the same day, and usually it was a launch day for one of your major projects. 
And I don't know why that happens, but it's a thing. I've asked other project managers. And so we kind of wanted to bottle up that noise, both for our project managers and our developers, and focus that on one department. So that's where our managed services team came from. Uh, so the ideal to me, and it's kind of where we're striving for, is I look forward to the day where one project manager has one project and they manage it start to finish because it, being able to go that deep on a project, to me personally, is really exciting. Uh, second question was regarding onboarding and you know the often long track for ramping up a project manager. And so we've done a couple of things there. Uh, we have, I've outlined milestones for the first 90 days of a project manager's time where a lot of that initially just involves shadowing, reading existing documentation. Uh, and there's kind of a transition point where we actually recently started two new project managers. And so there's a great senior project manager on our team and he kind of took the shadowing and the mentoring of one of the project managers and I took the other. And we're making sure that they're also doing some knowledge share. But basically what we've ended up doing is week one, week two, week three, I was leading calls and kind of leading and doing project management. Week three, week four, kind of getting to the point where I'm still in all the calls to the extent possible, but they're leading, they're taking notes, and we've made it clear to the clients from the start that ultimately they were going to be the project manager for that project. So it's really the, they're going to have the full knowledge. It worked out well in this case because we started them at the start of the projects. There wasn't the mid-project ramp up. Uh, but it's also an area where I've really identified because documentation becomes outdated, things that I did two years ago, and since then, our team has been really busy, and we haven't quite had somebody else go in and you know, fix a lot of the documentation, make sure it's up to date. And so where a lot of that's come from is it is more resource intensive and time intensive to properly ramp somebody up. It's ultimately a decision of do you try to figure out ways to keep your documentation up to date, or do you have spurts of time where, for example, right now, it's essentially, I don't have less to do in the rest of my job. It's just I also have to spend that extra time to make sure this new person is successful. And that's a significant amount of time. Uh, so it's for me, it's kind of the question of how many more times am I going to need to do this? And I don't anticipate hiring 10 project managers in the next year. If we did, that would be an easy, okay, we need to document, we need to plan, and we need to build a really big program around this. And so that's where I think on our junior side, like building the junior program, that's a little bit more focused effort because we're anticipating more hiring there. Yeah. Sure. So the question is talking about ex my personal experience hiring uh, with project managers, hiring at the more senior expensive level, hiring at the more junior level. Um, it's an interesting one. You find people where they have 20 years of project management experience, but digital project management is a practice. Like The longest you really could have been around in doing this is maybe 10 years. And even then, most of what you're doing 10 years ago isn't relevant. It's two, three, four, five years. So a lot of the senior project managers I'm seeing are often, they're newer to the industry, but they have a really focused uh, perspective on what's been happening recently. So we've hired senior project managers, or what I would consider senior project manager, even if that wasn't their job title, with less than five years experience. Um, we've also hired junior project managers essentially at zero experience. And I tend to err towards the junior side when possible. Uh, recently with these two new hires, we essentially had a senior and more, much more junior on the rest of the team. So we were weighted too far towards the junior side, and the amount of time it was taking for myself and the other senior members of the team was pretty significant. So we said, okay, these new hires, we're willing to pay a little bit more. We're going to look for a little bit more experience. But... To me, and actually there's a huge blog post on this one, or a huge series of blog posts on this one, so I do encourage you to check out the blog URL there. Uh, I basically went through, and if you ever apply to a job at Metal Toad, I kind of wrote the rubric for what it takes. And so if you go through that, you have the cheat sheet for what we're looking for. But I started talking about, you know, essentially as of when I wrote that post, what do we see the role as at Metal Toad? What are the knowledge and skills that are going to be really useful to a project manager? But also just simply what are the traits that somebody either has or doesn't have that's going to make them successful? So more than junior or senior, it's often do you have those traits or not that we're looking for? And even from there, I actually do go on in a further post to kind of talk about our hiring process and what our, even what our interviewing, interviewing looks like. So, Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you very much. And please do evaluate the session. It'll help them for next year. Hopefully, if I hear the feedback, it'll help me for next time I present, which will be, I do want to, I'm not helping organize, but I am speaking. And I'll give something similar but different at the PM Summit in October. I think it's the 6th and 7th. And it's actually at the Hyatt just across the river. So check that out. It's dpm2014.com. Thank you.